we'll give people a minute to get that notification too. Okay, we are live, so it is real. It is real, we're really there. Yay! <laughs> Yay! <laughs> the humans on the internet can see us. Woo! Hey, humans! Oh my goodness. I, I'm really excited, everyone, today. Uh, so, you know, I want to jump in. Uh, I was trying to wait a minute to give people a chance to pop in. Let me pull up these comments so I can see. Okay, there we go. There we go. Why is it doing that? Go away. Hang on. Delete. It like did some automatic thing. Okay. All right. So welcome. Thank you for your patience. We are, we are human beings doing a human broadcast. So, you know, it's a little, little bit uh, getting going at five after the hour. Uh, but as I said, I am super excited. I am thrilled uh, because I have a guest here with me today and it's someone whose Instagram page I have been following for a while now. It's one of my favorite pages and people on the internet. Um, this person is instantly, the minute I saw, started reading uh, their work became one of my favorite people to follow. And you know, let me tell you why, because I haven't told you this, I'm surprising you with this, sorry. I know some people may or not, may not dig all the praise, uh, but I also want to tell my readers and my, my viewers so that they understand why they should check you out too, uh, is that you challenge people. But at the same time, you explain everything so clearly, so clearly. Um, and you don't just challenge people. I think you really make them think and you really make me think. Uh, so, you know, I'm grateful for that because um, you made me think on so many occasions. So personally, this is my chance to say thank you uh, for all of that. Uh, I'm honored to have you here today uh, from the bottom of my heart. I I'd like to welcome uh, you, the amazing. Okay. I practice saying I practice saying this so many times. Asiatu, right? Uh -huh. You got it. Yes, I was like I practice saying it so many times for the live stream because I always want to be really respectful of people's names. I think that's really one of the least things we can do to be nice to people. You know, <laughs> to be kind and be, be kind. Uh, but you know, I you're, you're someone I'm, I've been wanting to have on the live stream for a while. So thanks for finally joining me and you know get, getting this together. Um, before we jump in. Because I've been rambling and waffling on for a while, I'd like to give you a chance to introduce yourself, um, share your pronouns, where people can find your work online, and what motivates you to do the brilliant work you're doing. Thanks. Well, thank you very much for having me. And it's so funny because you were one of the first, um, when I found out that I was autistic, you were one of the first people that I started following. Oh, wow. And I feel the same way about you because I was just like, especially with you know the Autism Speaks and the ABA. Like you were the first person that I like really got an understanding of of like the autistic community and what it means to be autistic. So oh wow. I feel oh my gosh, I'm honored to be here as you feel privileged to, for to interview me because yeah, you were the first, first, very first advocate that I actually followed. Oh wow. So thank you for I having no me. Idea. I had and, no yeah. idea. <laughs> I love I love your work too. So like, yeah, oh. this is fucking awesome. Um, <laughs> same. <laughs> For me, I'm, my name is Afiatu. Um, I am a autistic, trans, non-binary, uh, black, queer individual. Um, my pronouns are they, them. Um, I am an empowerment coach. So for me, I advocate for the oppressed and I give voice to experiences of those that, you know, are marginalized and don't necessarily have the access or um, the platform to really express themselves. So I speak from my lived experiences, but I also try my best to highlight um, individuals within other communities that I don't belong to make sure that you know their words are connect and resonate and are you know seen by many people because ultimately I'm about community and I feel like it's so important <laughs> to be um, within a community that uplifts, supports, appreciates, but also willing to do the work, willing to decolonize, willing to challenge the status quo and internalize beliefs and willing to be accountable and to grow and evolve and make decisions on behalf of everyone, not just the capitalistic individual, individualistic mindset. Oh, so I love it. That's me basically in a nutshell. <laughs> So yeah, I, have a, I do um, coaching for neurodivergent adults, uh, parents of, or guardians of neurodivergent children, as well as I do like professional consultation for those in the medical health field. And I also do speaking 
and panelists. So, and, and I don't know if I said intersectional education as well. So that's that, that's me. <laughs> You're a person <laughs> with many talents and many skills. <laughs> and, and can I say, I love, you know, what I've noticed about on your Instagram page, something you do that I think is uh, more people should be doing. And I hope people take notice is when you reshare someone else's work on Instagram, you always have their image and their username, like in the top with it, or you, you make sure to actually like yeah. credit the other original person for their work, oh, which is something sure. we don't see happening enough either it's like really actually amplifying people uh in, in a way that actually helps people find them because I, it, you know i i like to if i see something someone says that i like i want to go follow them follow the original exactly. poster uh and then you know the people do it now it's like oh well i didn't i got to the expose this new person but i can't actually go connect with them you know if they do it the way a lot of people do uh, yeah, so if, if anyone out there is resharing things on Instagram, just kind of go, go look uh, and, and see what's, what, what's, how this is being done because it looks like so much better. It's just so easy. It's like right there at the top uh, and it makes it real easy to find and explore new voices because I think that's so important that we listen to people whose perspectives are different from ours, especially like we can get in these silos or these echo chambers really easily um, and not... Mm -hmm not be experienced to people who have different experiences than us. And then, you know, when we don't understand, speaking from, you know, my experience as a trans person, people often don't understand the ways that they are being hurtful because they don't understand that community or that group because they're not part of that group. Yeah, and they just kind of go through and they, they think, they may even think they're helping. You know, people exactly. may even think they're helping and they're just, creating a lot of damage so yeah I, I'm grateful because you, you do help me find other people with different perspectives you know um, in all walks of life so I love your page as a resource for that but then your your thoughts as well are really always <laughs> helpful uh, and you know on that note you know today you know, you're here you have the floor is there anything just on your mind that you just feel like you really want to get out there or you need to rant about today or is there just something there's always something <laughs> story of my life which is why I'm always posting stuff um recently it's just more so this understanding that um I want people to understand that if people had better choices they would make better choices oh, and yeah. I think people get caught up in you know trying to demonize or especially with like the stigma and especially this ableistic stigma of autistics and cluster b but oh, yeah. I just wanted to say that you know if someone offered the average person a dollar versus a thousand. There are not very many people that would take the dollar versus the a thousand. The people that do, you know, are in that situation and, you know, are doing the best that they can. And especially like just the whole concept of victim blaming. And I think society is really good at victim blaming to avoid accountability of the privilege. Mm -hmm. So when it comes to like survivors of, you know, domestic abuse, especially women, it's just like, oh, well, why did they stay? No, like mm. what other options could she have had or they have had to get out of that situation? What limited options and resources did they have that, you know, didn't allow them to choose something different and that goes for anybody under any circumstance any marginalized person like I, I hate that's why I don't like the whole concept when people say like oh you deserve better okay but if better is never presented to me <laughs> realistically mm -hmm. in my life then of course I'm going to you know do with what I can with what I have and what I have isn't very much and that might look like trauma that might look like you know, hurting other people that might be look like being victimized, whatever the case is. So I just wish people would just pause and think and just be like, people make the best decisions based on what options they have. And the sad part and the sad reality is not very many people have a lot of healthy, supportive options. And that oh. even goes for ABA and parents. And I understand that, you know, I empathize with parents and the system in the sense of you know, there aren't any other options or there are not very many options. And sometimes that's literally the only option that will be covered by insurance. So it's all interconnected. Oh, and, yeah. But that still doesn't negate the harm and the impact of ABA. So at mm -hmm. the same time, it's all about both ends. I can both empathize and also still speak to the harm. So yeah. So yeah, all of that all of that on my mind recently <laughs> like yeah a lot, that, a lot that's of, my, my new my, new, my things current. have been on my mind too I feel you <laughs> yeah, yeah. 
Uh, just, and, I just and, love people to be nicer. Not even yes. nice. I hate like kinder. Kind. kind. Yes. Just truly empathize. kind. Just not fake nice. Real nice. Yeah. I hate nice. Mm-hmm. It's superficial yeah. to just bullshit. Yeah. No, be mm-hmm. kind. Like just know that people are doing the best they can with what they know and the choices that they have. And if oh, you yeah. hurt somebody, just apologize. Mm-hmm. Don't yeah. necessarily center, don't ne- don't center yourself. Don't get defensive. Breathe, pause. Like I just posted a little yeah. earlier today about cognitive dissonance and how to respond to cognitive dissonance. And cognitive dissonance basically is the stress that you have when you're presented with an opposing belief of what you believe in. So the contradiction of those two causes stress. And mm-hmm people go into protective mode and then get defensive. And so I wrote about her, <laughs> PR. I loved it. I loved it. Please share that. <laughs> so her is pause, reflect, respond. So if someone says something to you that's holding you accountable and is uncomfortable, and the first step is to pause, take a breath, like literally at least five seconds, just mm-hmm. sit with it and a, like just feel your emotions try to connect to those emotions but the most important thing is just pause and pause can be five seconds pause can be 10 minutes pause can be the next day you yeah. know what I mean but pause like allow what somebody is saying to really like just get into all of your mm-hmm. crevices that mm-hmm. sounds really weird but anyway yeah then, but it- <laughs> pause, reflect reflect is you know what like your discomfort is telling you something like you're uncomfortable because that's an indication that work needs to be done and 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 so connect with that connect with that understanding that the harm that you're feeling is it is probably just a fraction of the harm that was caused by your actions so connect with that connect with the pain connect with the discomfort connect with the uncomfortable, connect with the desire to want to protect yourself because the person you harmed is trying to do the same thing by holding you accountable. Mm -hmm. And then then respond after you go through all that by being accountable, by not centering yourself, by avoiding getting defensive, by validating the other person's feelings and making amends and really doing the work and being committed to changing your behavior for the future. And knowing that it's a lifelong journey, like colonizing, decolonizing isn't ever going to happen within one lifetime and definitely not within our lifetime. So, yeah. and everybody needs to decolonize because it's like, you can't be a fish in water and not be wet. So <laughs> yeah, we're all wet. <laughs> we're all in water. So we all have shit that we have to deal with. And majority of us have some kind of privilege and usually multiple privileges on, you know, some level. Mm-hmm. So you have even if you're oppressed you too have work to do we all have work to do so and then there's internalized oppression that you know people like internalized ableism that I know I struggle with that I still have Mm -hmm. to constantly deconstruct all the time and catch myself I have internalized transphobia that I still have to deconstruct and catch myself and it's a lifelong journey it's not a destination and we're just we just have to be comfortable in our discomfort and know Mm -hmm. that it's okay, you know, and you're going to make mistakes, and I make mistakes, and I love the fact that I have a community that's like, hey, you know, that's not cool, and even I have to catch myself, and I'm like, hmm, I really want to get defensive, but what is this trying to tell me? What do I need to do? How do I need to pause? So I have to, Mm -hmm. you know, practice what I preach, too. This is not easy. It fucking is difficult as shit, but it's so fucking worth it, because I don't ever want to know that I conscious, like, I in unconsciously hurt somebody regardless Mm -hmm. impact is always more important and weighs so much more than intent intent literally shouldn't even be a part of the conversation because if someone shoots you accidentally versus on purpose does your pain or your suffering or the damage change no it still fucking hurts (laughs) and Mm -hmm, it still mm -hmm. takes a long time to heal and it's you still have to take medicine you still have to do all those things regardless of the person's intent so intent doesn't matter. So yeah, that's my number one pet peeve is just like, well, I didn't intend to, I don't care what you intended. <laughs> like you shot me, <laughs> like whether it was my mistake or not, like I have a fucking bullet in my body right now. <laughs> like, can we focus on that please? 
Like, stop centering yourself. I'm fucking bleeding. Stop. Yes. So yeah. See, you make it so clear. And see, <laughs> I'm going to admit that even you know years ago when I started stepping into like these spaces, I didn't understand some of these nuances. I didn't understand like, well, I'm trying to, you know, it's like, okay, but you're, you're you know, like I said earlier, we don't realize we're causing harm sometimes. And I didn't realize, you know, and then, I'm, and then the other thing is that feeling like defensive and like not understanding that kind of trauma response when you feel like you're being attacked and that you need to take back and breathe. Like I've realized, I also didn't know myself very well when I started because I was like just figuring out I was autistic. Uh, and so I've realized now that I know myself more, I am really someone who processes things on an extreme delay. Like I'm the one who needs to probably go take 24 to 40 hours at least to sit with something. Because if it has to do with like feelings, uh, it's a lot of a gray. I got to really figure out what the feelings are. You know, if it's more concrete facts and statistics and graphs, oh yeah, I can sort through that real easy. But if I've got to deal with my own feelings and figure out why is this giving me this feeling and what have I got to get past? And, you know, I, cause I can't apologize unless I sincerely mean it. I do need yes. to mean it. And I need yes. to understand what I'm apologizing for. I have to comprehend yes. it. <laughs> me too. I'm the same way. I'm, and I think a lot of autistics are, which is why I think it kind of plays into the you know stigma and the false stereotype that we're unempathetic because oh, yeah. neurotypicals an apology isn't necessarily genuine it's just wanted you know what i mean and it's just superficial and it's just like it's just commonplace and just standard you know what i mean like mm -hmm. for us no when we apologize we mean it otherwise we're oh, not yeah. going to say it so then mm -hmm. you know and it, and therefore we're perceived as cold or detached or unempathetic no it's not that we don't feel by any means and a lot of us you know identify myself included as hyper empathic it's just mm -hmm. I need to fully understand and I need to fully digest and that's another reason why I hate it when people are just like well why are you trying to bring up something that happened you know such a long time ago or like last week or we got all over that or we passed that no clearly we didn't because it's still in my mind and my feelings are valid and I have every right to express myself and to bring up whatever I feel that I need to, to help process my emotions in which you harmed me. So mm -hmm. I don't care if it's a week later, five months later, six months later, a year later, I don't give a fuck. Like I still have that right. And I'm not saying that it's okay to constantly, you know, berate and harass somebody by any means. But if it's something that I'm still trying to work through and I'm still trying to process, part of making amends is creating a safe space for me to express myself because you know you harmed me. And mm -hmm. that's what I think people are lacking in understanding. Yeah, and, and you would think too, like if this is someone that wants to be in a relationship with you, you know, it's like outside of this, like they would be, they would want to help you make sure you are understanding one another and that, you know, you know like it's it's a respect thing. And then like, you know, the other, other side of that is like online because I'm a delayed processor. Some people need a response like online or in person. Like when you get in that heat of an argument and someone wants a response right now, right now, right now. And it's like, yeah, I need time. I need time. I need time. <laughs> you know? Yeah. I'm, and then I, and then I would like comment on things like, you know, like you online, like a few days later and they'd be like, oh, like, you know, you're bringing it up. Like we've already passed that. Or, you know, I, why are you still stuck on this? Or, you know what I mean? Like, let it go. Just classic gaslighting. And I'm just like, mm -hmm. cause I process differently and I need time and I have every right to express myself again, especially if you caused harm. So mm -hmm. yeah, stop trying to tell and police me because that's not okay. And yeah. <laughs> let's, let's, you know, either get on my page or you're just going to get blocked. And that, and that's an option too. And oh, I have yeah. no problem doing that at all. I have, mm -hmm. I'm constantly blocking people and I know you are too. Cause oh, it took me a while to figure that out, but yeah, I am yeah, now. We just don't tolerate <laughs> oppression in our space. I, we're safe spaces. So I'm mm -hmm. committed to keeping my space safe. So if you're not committed to doing that and you feel like you are entitled to say things that are hurtful without being held accountable, I don't want you in my space, point blank period. And you don't, you can go elsewhere. There's plenty yeah. of other people you can follow. <laughs> like. It's just mm -hmm. not going to be in my space because I'm not going to allow that to happen. Oh, yeah. There's a lot of completely unmoderated pages out there where you can uh, go I free for all it. in those comment threads. Like, Which is mine. part of the reason why I always said, like, I didn't necessarily want to get big because mm -hmm. I don't ever want to lose that intimacy and I don't ever want to lose being a safe space. And I also don't want to ever be 
perpetuate the status quo because the majority yeah. of people who have such a large um, a mass a large following is because they perpetuate the status quo and that's what people are used to hearing and that's you know how they get and then they when these people get these large accounts and then they don't know what to do with it and then you know they end up doing more harm than good and so for me like that was always a fear for a very long time whereas now i realize that in building community, I have other people that can participate as well. So like, I love seeing in my comments when someone holds somebody else accountable and I don't have to do anything or, you know, or the opposite of that, when they, you know, give praise and love and appreciation mm -hmm. acceptance, you know, to others within the comments, you know, without even like, it was just so beautiful to see. And I'm just like, that's what I want. Like, this is community. And, and I'm, when I say community, I mean it. I mean mm -hmm. community and I mean connection and I mean responsibility of, you know, emotions and feelings and, you know, other people. And that's what we're missing in society as a whole, which is why we're going through all this fuckery and this dystopia. <laughs> <laughs> like, that's why we're in this shit right we are now is because we, we forgot what community means. And going back to like, you know, indigenous and African cultures and so many other cultures out like pre-colonization, that's what the mindset was. And it was beautiful. <laughs> I mean, not to say everything was perfect, but the sense of responsibility and sacrifice for the betterment of the whole mm -hmm. was, you know, a healthy mindset to have because that's what connection is. That's what building is. That's what support is. To me, that's what, I'm an atheist, but that's what God is. God to me is community. Like, yeah. I, want, I don't want to be able to ask you know, for support and not necessarily, you know, praying, but to me, prayers are asking for support for people in your life. You know what I mean? God mm -hmm. is people blessing you with support and appreciation and understanding. And yeah, so it's just, this dystopia just, it's, it's horrible. <laughs> I we're hate capitalism. I know, it's like, capitalism. That, I was like, well, I was about to say, we're all trapped in capitalism. Yeah, it's just <laughs> capitalism. And and people don't even understand, like everything is connected with capitalism, like mm -hmm. racism, patriarchy, it's all ableism. It all goes back to capitalism. And that's just, that's the main root. And then capitalism had three babies, patriarchy, um, racism, no, two babies, patriarchy, racism, and then capitalism. Those are the three main roots. Yeah. And I was like, it's time to go, go away. <laughs> like, like it's, it's, it's done. We've been, it's not working. Well, it's working no. for the room. And, uh, you know, it, it isn't working though, really, because, you know, if we look at it right now, we've got employers that for so many years have been exploiting their human resources like machines, right? And we're people, we need to be treated like people. And so they're like burning people out and people they are like, why do we have all this turnover? And they don't realize that the people that are burning out are actually people that cared a lot about their jobs because it was like, you have to care to burn out. Yeah. That's why we yeah. have advocates that burn out because it, they care too much and they burn themselves out because they don't stop yes. because there is endless work. <laughs> yeah. And so we, ha we, we can't treat ourselves like machines you know yeah. or or we fall apart because we're not meant to constantly go at the forever pace and so now you know you're trying to capitalist people complaining nobody wants to work it's like no everybody is woke the fuck up and is tired of excuse my language is tired of being exploited <laughs> exactly oh, you don't care exactly. Got, i remember your favorite word is the f word i was like yeah it's right there <laughs> yes that's right um but you know it, it's like people are waking up and realizing that their time actually has value now. Like there's, yes. you know, death and horrible Love. things all around us, you know? Yes. Like, yes. so now we're like, well, you know, my loved ones may not be here tomorrow. Why am I gonna spend all my time doing this thing that sucks away my soul, you yep. know? And, and so, it doesn't give you enough time off. Or it doesn't, no. give a, it doesn't give two shits about you. You're, like they're gonna I, face you in a heartbeat. You know yeah. I mean? doesn't care if someone dies, doesn't care if you have a baby, doesn't care if you have a family, just, they don't care. They literally don't care. So why should you care about something that literally doesn't give two shits about you? And you're supposed to invest yourself and your time and your emotions and your energy into something that literally doesn't reciprocate that on any fucking, even the basics of level? Like, hell no. That's why so many of us are entrepreneurs because we were just like fuck the fuck the corporations and fuck corporate because we're not valued and we couldn't function 
And that's not how we function. And I feel like that's what's so beautiful about neurodivergence is it highlights the toxicity of capitalism. And, oh, yeah. And I think it's a beautiful, beautiful thing. And I wish it was, you know, embraced more, not to the extent that, that it's commodified and exploited, but <laughs> just the mentality. I wish it was more normalized and understood that, like, we 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 can't we help you know what i'm saying we highlight we have so much more to offer than what people realize and give us credit for you know what i mean and, it, and it's and it's just so frustrating because it's so dehumanizing and it's just like we see so much and know so much and connect so much way more you know what i mean and even art can be super productive you know even to a fault <laughs> you know what i mean where we have mm -hmm. to catch ourselves and it's just like okay you have to take a break i know i i go through that so it's just oh, yeah. like we have so much, so much to offer. And I just wish we were not constantly dehumanized, especially autistics. Like, I'm so sick of seeing cure shit. Mm -hmm. Like, who are you to tell us that we want a fucking cure? Like, what? That's like basically saying, like, I want a cure for being black, like, or I want a cure for being trans. Like, what the fuck? <laughs> like no well we have conversion therapy and then people are just like oh well, what about the people with high support needs well those with high support needs if they're actually accommodated and supported and valued and appreciated then maybe their needs wouldn't be you know so high and or they would just feel so valued and appreciated and loved that that would be a beautiful thing regardless and they could live in a world where they're accepted and valued it's not us that's the problem it's the fucking broken ass world and it's so frustrating you know like, when no when when i get to which is rare these days like stand in a room with people to talk about these issues like i have this question i like to ask people and i ask the whole room i'm like everyone raise your hand if having to pretend or act like someone or something you're not makes you miserable and of course everyone always raises their hand like i've yet to stand in a room and have not every hand go up but it's because it's a, it's like universal human experience to need to be loved and accepted as you are, strengths, weaknesses, the whole person. Yep. But with neurodivergent and autistic people, for some reason, it's like, love, well, you know, it's like that, be yourself, but not like that. Exactly. We, we have a different standard. We're not allowed to be loved and accepted for who we are. We need to try harder to be something else. And that is not fair. That is soul crushing. It's, it's so, ah, uh, that's. Part of the reason why I was suicidal for so long, and I still suffer from suicidal ideation, but finding the autistic community like literally saved my life, like and getting the diagnosis and mm -hmm. you know having the why to my struggles and having the why to why I wasn't thriving like at all my peers, you know what I mean? Like it just it gave me the opportunity to have so much grace for myself and so much more acceptance and love for myself because I'm just like instead of saying my perception before was just like, oh my God, like what is wrong with me? I'm so broken. Like I can't do what, you know, I'm supposed to be doing and everybody else is thriving. So once I got my diagnosis, I'm like, holy shit, look at all the shit I accomplished going so long without support and not being diagnosed. Like mm -hmm. it totally flipped my self-perception for the better. And it's just like, wow, I accomplished a whole lot. And I'm oh, accomplishing yeah. a whole lot despite not having the supports that I need. And that made me value myself even more because it's just like you know i'm not broken i'm fucking amazing <laughs> like holy shit, this is wonderful and then i found community and other people that understood me and then i stopped being alone you know what i mean like i was always the black sheep and i was always like the outsider looking in and then i finally found other people and then like we became a community and it was the autistic community and then it was just like oh people that understand me, people that speak my language, people that know, you know, don't get mad at me for literally being who I am or not responding or having time blindness or running behind or, you know, lack of flexibility or whatever the case is. It's just like, I don't, that, oh, that's another thing. I really want neurodivergent people out there, please stop apologizing for who you are. And it crushes my heart every single time I get comments or I get messages that's just like, sorry for oversharing or sorry for this long comment or mm -hmm. i didn't mean to you know go so long or like you're beautiful and valid the way that you are like how you express yourself is just is like it's totally you and that's a beautiful thing like just be mindful of the internalized ableism of always constantly apologizing for neurodivergent traits the oversharing the being mm -hmm. verbose 
you know, all of that is just neurodivergent traits that you shouldn't ever feel shame for, especially not when talking to a fellow person who yeah. speaks your language. I'm like, of all the places to apologize, it's not to me. And mm-hmm. I say that with the, the, the most love and the most kindness, like I am you, <laughs> like I am a safe space. I speak your language. You don't have to apologize to me for being who you are ever, 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 ever. So yeah, I just wanted to throw that up. That's a good one because what was it? Not this year. So every year, like I try to work on like, like I'm like one of those like annoying people that's always trying to grow, be growing and be bettering themselves, right? And so I'm one of those annoying people. So every year I pick like something I want to work on. And like, I think it was a couple of years ago, like one of them was not apologizing so much because I realized I was like, sorry, 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 sorry for existing basically to every exactly. single thing. And so I had to, it was hard. I think it took at least a whole year, maybe a year and a half to train myself to stop apologizing apologize. for things. It's hard. But, it's definitely hard, but I just, I see it so often and all the time. And I'm like, don't apologize to me. You don't need to apologize to me or anybody, but especially me, because I get you. I'm like, have you not like met me? <laughs> like I, I am you. I literally like I'm super verbose, you know what I mean? I'm always thinking, I'm always analyzing. Like that's just, I have anxiety. Like that's just who I am. And it's okay to be that way and exist in this world regardless of what the world has tried to tell you otherwise. So yes, please just cherish yourself and give yourself grace and love and stop apologizing for who you are because there's no there's no need to feel shame for it at all whatsoever. I love it. I agree so much. Uh, and that's something I didn't know, you know, when, and like, it was similar to you. You're like, oh, you realize, oh, it's not my fault. And man, I'm not an inferior neurotypical that can't do these things that I think I should be able to do because I'm comparing myself to someone with a totally different brain than me, like fish to dogs and fish climbing exactly. trees and dogs <laughs> breathing underwater. You know, it didn't even make sense to make these comparisons. So I didn't know that until I knew I was neurodivergent. And then yeah. it was like, oh, wow, look at what I, what I, what I've done so far. And then, gee, imagine what I could have done if I had support earlier. So, you know, I even was, I was pretty angry when I was first diagnosed. You know, there's like that feeling of, I went 29 years with no support. Ah, yeah. Shit. I went 41 years without, oh, wow. The thing was, I was actually diagnosed ADD at the time, which is ADHD and puberty. But even okay. back then, they still didn't know what to do with me. All I got mm-hmm. for accommodations was just untimed testing. That was it. <laughs> like, yeah, they didn't. They didn't know. You know what I mean? Like they, the school didn't know about learning disabilities and things of that nature. And I requested to have more visual, you know, information and aids in class. But outside of that, I got nothing. And I went to a private school and pretty progressive at the time, you know. But they just didn't know. And I didn't realize how much ADHD affected so much of who I was because of the general understanding of, okay, it was just, you know, being hyper or inability to focus. Nobody talked about the executive dysfunction. Nobody talked about the time blindness or, blindness or the object permanence, but especially mm-hmm. the executive dysfunction <sighs> is just like, that's everything (laughs) like or the 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 memory issues Mm -hmm. or the jump in you know in conversation and people always just like oh you're so rude because you're always interrupting me like there's so much more to just ADHD than just you know being hyper and having intention issues that we're now just starting to become mainstream which I think is such a beautiful thing which is why I applaud people who you know advocate and also put out content that people can relate to or just and then it inspires them to go get checked out because it's, it's, it's so much more than what, what I had thought. And then that combined with the autism, it was just like, but I, for me at first, I thought like you in the sense that I was kind of angry, but then I realized it potentially could have been worse because then I could have been like an ADA. Same. It was like, yeah. yeah, the deeper you and fall down the wormhole. Like, but then I was like, Ugh. <laughs> they didn't really know what the fuck they were doing with ADHD, let alone autism. And I was like, mm-hmm. I guarantee you I would have ended up in ABA and that would have been horrible. So I think not knowing in certain aspects actually helped protect me. Um, and especially being black and being AFAB. Yeah. So I think that that people tend to always look at hindsight or the possibility always through rose colored glasses. And I was like, it's just as as probable that it was positive as it would, would have been negative. And I mm-hmm. think that's what people 
tend to not understand or forget. So they, you know, they always look back and be like, what if, what if, what if? And I shoulda, coulda, woulda. And I was like, yeah, but it's just as likely that those things could have changed out worse than what they did because it's 50 oh, yeah. So yeah. instead of just focusing on just the positive, just know that, you know, the opposite could have easily, just as easily occurred as well. So I'm just happy that I got my diagnosis. I found my community and now I'm helping other people, especially little kids. Oh, I just wanted to share one of the, yeah. my favorite experiences ever in my entire life is I work with um, a mother of an autistic <clears throat> child and the child had just switched to a charter school um, because they were diagnosed autistic and they were struggling and they had been bullied in their other school and they were struggling. And so the mom decided to switch schools and find a charter school, which was much more neurodivergent affirming. But um, I think she's in second grade, second or third oh, wow. grade. And she was, so she's autistic, starting a new school. So that is anxiety in and of itself. And, you know, having the fear of a repeat of what her old school is like, you know, I'm sure. Yeah. You can understand. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And so I talked to, I even talked to the, to, to the child um, a few times, but the mom had texted me that in like a few weeks into school um, for show and tell, they brought um, one of the Unikin um, pouches that I actually gave her pencil pouch or whatever. And she actually Aww. had bought a shirt. And for show and tell, she talks to the class about what Unikin means Aww. and that she was autistic and how so proud of what, how proud she is of being, or how proud they are of being autistic. And I was just like, ah, oh, like tears, just, just the tears of just like, just knowing I'm like, ah, oh, just, it's the total opposite of the experience in which they had previously, but also my experience growing up of being bullied and misunderstood mm-hmm. or whatever, to get a child to embrace their autism at such a like young age and be proud and comfortable enough in a new environment to share, which is kudos to the school for creating such a safe environment that they felt comfortable to do so, but also just, uh, it was just so beautiful. So that's what I love doing what I do and why I always fight. It's just moments like that where I'm just like, it's so fucking worth it. It's so worth it. All the ableism transphobia and racism that I deal with for moments like that is just it's so worth it it's it's just worth it and I'm going to continue to do it for as long as I can because of moments like that I want so many like autistic kids just to be so proud and happy and just know that they're not alone and there's like a whole fucking community that's like like, rooting for them Mm -hmm. that's my goal that's that's a good goal that's a, I mean, we, you know, it's like we want the next generation to not have to go through the same junk yes. that we went through. And, you know, luckily, I think more of the kids are probably going to be caught and diagnosed, you know, now yeah. Yeah. Uh, because we have more understanding of the process. Like sometimes people are all panicking, saying, oh, there's an epidemic. There's more autistic people. And you and I know it's like, no, the diagnosis We've always been has here. been evolving since like exactly. 1980 and it keeps including more people. And so exactly. it's not, you know, it's just, we, we're just identified now. You know, we've got so many of us, especially like our age, my age, your age, old and older even, like I, I meet people online in our communities who are figuring out they're autistic in their like 60s, 70s. We've probably, you know, got people in the audience today who are discovering, you know, later in life yep. because it we've got that missing generation you know yep. people you know my age and older especially like the ADHD with me it was the other way around like even though they suspected I had ADHD as a kid my mom was really afraid because it was like the 90s and that's when it was like you know Ritalin was coming out and she was just really scared um mm-hmm. about that and everything so she was like there's nothing wrong with my child how dare you because the stigma that was like pushed yeah. by the school it was approached in a very stigmatized way and so it was like no 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 uh, and then I didn't get diagnosed with ADHD until earlier this year, actually. I was diagnosed autistic first. And then okay. that, you know, that was like a shock of my life at 29 because it's like, oh, wait, what? <laughs> you know, you don't <laughs> expect something like that when you're almost 30, just like I'm sure you're, you're well, you had ADHD yeah. first. So that might have been a little bit less. Well, shock, ADHD but... was made sense to me. And basically damn near everybody in my family is ADHD so like that made sense Mm -hmm. but I still always felt like an outsider so like I knew there was I felt like there was a missing piece but I didn't realize it until I got like and I literally found out or started this journey from reading a post online um from I think autism goggles 
Oh, wow. Okay. And that they posted a post about um, traits and quote unquote women and girls. And I was just like, holy shit. Like all the list traits, all the traits listed were me. Like all 12, 13 of them, I'm like, check, check, check. And I'm like, holy shit. Am I fucking mm-hmm. awesome? <laughs> and, mm-hmm. like, mm-hmm. and then I just, of course, typical went down the rabbit hole you know, absorb, 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 research, research, research. And then I was just like, yeah, I'm totally autistic. <laughs> yeah. And I was just like, it explained everything, like everything. And it just, it was so comforting. And yeah, it was just comforting, super comforting. I mean, the information is crucial, like so crucial. Like I, I was contemplating very horrible things for myself before I found out I was autistic because mm-hmm. I just didn't think I was going to be able to do things anything anymore I was just so at my end and everything seemed so dark and figuring this out did that perspective split that both of you and I have experienced I think a lot of other people uh in the readership and um, watching today have probably experienced similar because a lot of people kind of gravitate towards you know people have similar experiences um but you know that process of getting a diagnosis like we've got so many problems with that process like all over the world there are different problems like in Europe and the UK their wait lists are years long yeah. you know uh, yeah. and and in here it's like when I when I was looking for someone to, to to get an assessment there was only four people that did adults and we're in a major metropolitan area it's probably different now but I you know I, I was given a list from the autism society and it was just you know when I got it was just four just four wow that even saw adults back then and there you know there was a lot more just they they were in-house with ABA therapy centers a lot of times and so they have no incentive to diagnose someone who might not get ABA yeah so you know there wasn't there was just nothing out there uh and then after I was diagnosed I was I could feel like I was one of the lucky ones because the person who diagnosed me was like I was like oh my god this is what's wrong with me you know I was in that mindset at first Mm-hmm. Uh, and then the, the the doctor, she's like, no, there's nothing wrong with you. Your mind works differently. You need to adjust your life to accommodate that. And you know, that it, mm-hmm. those words, and then her recommending autistic voices, like books by autistic authors and things like that being my first experience, like how you came across that autistic voice. And I was like, oh, these, these match me, check, check, check. And yeah. then I started to read and hear autistic stories and was, oh my gosh, this is me. Exactly. It was so affirming. And then you go to Google. You know, and then you see what's on the internet. And it's Ugh. so bad. It's so bad. It's 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 the system. And what I tell people all the time is it's it's very similar to the mentality of racism within the US and then expecting black people to be gung-ho about the vaccine. And mm-hmm. I compare that, you know, very similarly to wanting autistic people to get diagnosis yet a lot of therapists are ableist as fuck. So Mm -hmm. you you expect the most vulnerable to go into the mouth of a lion, (laughs) you know what I mean? To to get, you know, what they need. And of course people are going to be fucking hesitant. (laughs) You know what I mean? Like it's just common sense. Like, of course you'll be hesitant. There's so many therapists. I have therapy trauma from a child when I was in therapy for my ADHD and other and depression and anxiety, like I have so much trauma. And for years I was just, that's part of the reason why I didn't even want to get a diagnosis um, for autism. And the only reason why I did was because I was able to find a black trans autistic therapist. Oh, wow. Yeah. I found a fucking unicorn. <laughs> Uh, there's probably a lot of people that would like that contact info from me. I don't know if they're yeah. still practicing. I don't, I, I have to, or if you don't give it out. They're updated, but, um, they, they weren't seeing patients for some time. Mm-hmm. Um, but I think now they might be, but if they are, I will definitely, I was for a long time was constantly recommending them. Yeah. Um, that's, but that's then they, they got burnt out like we do, you know, yeah. we always want to help people. We mm-hmm. overextend and then we pay the consequences and the impact and then you know, depression or whatever mm-hmm. kicks in. So burnout. Um, so yeah, but uh, yeah, I found them. And that's the only reason why I got a di- like a medical diagnosis. It was because I found them and I had been looking for 
like therapists and majority of the therapists, like you said, that I reached out to were just like, oh yeah, you know, I worked with autistic, more so kids, not adults. And I'm like, well, that's not going to be helpful. (laughs) Mm -hmm. And then I'm like, okay, well, have you dealt with, you know, women or non-men, you know, diagnosing? And they're just like, yeah, no. Or they would say, oh, well, it's not really that much of a difference. Okay, bye. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. And we're done. (laughs) Like, Mm -hmm. yeah. So there were just so many ignorant comments and I was just about to give up, but then I found them and I found them through a mutual, um, client of, or patient of theirs that was also autistic. Um, so again, just the autistic community just helped me Mm -hmm. out and came through and, and it was, that was how I got my diagnosis at 41. So that was last year. It's only been a little over a year. October last year is when I got my medical diagnosis. And then May of last year is when I read that post. And I was just like, oh, I'm fucking autistic. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. (laughs) And then the added layer of this all is my mom is a retired pediatrician. So her concept of autism was so heavily ableist and so white boy centered that, you know, she didn't even consider like me being autistic it was just oh you're just ADHD and you know depression and anxiety which I mean compared to what she was taught and what is out there yeah I don't seem like I would be autistic for sure because I'm not a white boy (laughs) and my traits do you know manifest differently so yeah I, I wouldn't think that I was autistic either and that's the thing majority of the people either assume autism is are just traits specific to like white boys or they think that it's you know the ex- what is deemed the extreme or high supports you know needs without it being a spectrum and I'm like spectrum is literally in it <laughs> like it's the autism spectrum <laughs> it's a spectrum <laughs> it's not just one thing it's a spectrum but then this whole concept to me reality is everything about human nature is a spectrum Nothing is like very few absolutes in, in life, especially with human behavior, exists. So yeah. even when it comes to depression, there's a spectrum. Anxiety, there's a there's a spectrum. Schizophrenia, there's a spectrum. Everything is a spectrum. Like literally, emotions, a spectrum. Sexuality, gender, spectrum. <laughs> like, do you like it's everything's a fucking spectrum? <laughs> like, if we could just get rid of the fucking binary, that would be great. The binary binary, does not exist. It's not exactly. (laughs) And the binary isn't just gender and sexuality, it's in everything. And that's what people don't understand. This whole concept of good, evil, fat, thin, black, white, gay, straight, you know, cis, trans, that's all binary. And within the binary, if you value something, then you automatically devalue the opposite. And that's what people need to realize because people just like, oh, it's just personal preferences. No, your preferences imply within the binary that it's better than the opposite. White is better than black. Skinny is better than fat. Like, you know, cis is better than trans. It's not just that they exist. No, it's within the binary. And that's another thing I wish people would understand. Like, just the basics. If we could just get society to understand the basics, it would be great. <laughs> like, it's so frustrating. Like, we see everything, and it's so blatantly obvious to us, and everyone's just like, oh, okay. <laughs> or just not paying mm-hmm. attention, or just mm-hmm. because they're privileged, then they don't have to. They don't fucking care, which, again, goes back to community. You have to yes. carry on yourself. Yes, yes. Um, you know, we're we're jump, you know it's almost like seven till the top of the hour I don't know if you have something <laughs> I, I don't know if you have something okay I just want to make sure because I want to be very <laughs> respectful of your time um okay. yeah of course um so I can talk to you I, forever though <laughs> I know this could go on and on this is awesome I was like I don't I didn't even really need the questions like I had them just in case it's like it's been so natural it's been great uh yeah. but that's what happens when you get like, you find your people meet. yes Exactly. I thought I was so weird and awkward and then I met other people and were like I'm not awkward with other neurodivergent people exactly. that was like the first thing I noticed yeah. like I when I used to get to go to conferences you know gosh it seems like it's been another life ago now that we've you know been through the lockdown I one of the first things I noticed was if it was an autism conference that actually had autistic people there 
mm-hmm. and you're like in the circle of autistic people and then some neurotypical shuffles in it is really funny to see them be awkward because they now <laughs> are you know they are the odd That's one awkward. in the group then you know like I want more of That's that awesome. I want more neurodivergent people to experience that and to see like that dynamic because we've been told we're the awkward one we've been told we're the you know the weird one and it's I really like in that experience it like solidified my belief that it is only because we are the minority that we are awkward air quotes I hate you know I hate that presumption it's like because we are compared to neurotypical people it's like that relative in comparison to it's like why are we being compared to them all the time I don't know I I think that's something I I love your analogy in the sense that I feel like it's like basically we're fish and they're dogs and it's like you're comparing a fish to a dog and I'm like you're expecting a fish to bark (laughs) and climb a tree exactly it makes absolutely no sense when you put it in that context it's that illogical it's like those two things can exist you know together appreciate the differences and also be valued equally like it doesn't have to be either or hence the fucking binary like dogs and fish can can coexist and it's okay and it's a beautiful thing they have and I like your the the fact of like I would love to experience that more with neurodivergent like groupings and then seeing the neurotypical and I also would like that applied to other marginalized communities of like white people being the only people within a you know sea of like black people or indigenous people oh yeah and knowing what that feels like you know to be the one that stands out all the fucking time or you know or even just you know role play like tokenism you know and make and so that they understand what it's like and that's what privilege is all about is that you are shielded from the experiences of other people and therefore you think that that's the norm when in all actuality there's plenty of us going through a whole lot of shit you just don't experience (laughs) yeah and that's the problem like you have to empathize with the reality that other people experience life different and marginalization differently than you do because you have privilege and that's the whole point of privilege it shields you from certain experiences usually that are harmful and traumatizing and hurtful Uh, I I'm gonna agree with all of that and just say that I think that growing up when I was younger you know my family we moved into a particular neighborhood when I was growing up where it was not a white neighborhood for the first time. And I was in middle or elementary school when this happened, it was like fourth grade, fourth grade. And it was hard for me because I had been in a town that was very whitewashed, you know, up until that point. But I think it was one of the best experiences of my entire life going Mm -hmm. through that. And I am so grateful that I did go through that because it did give me experiences that Mm -hmm. I wouldn't have understood. Just like you're saying, white people should go experience being the only white person like yep. I absolutely agree with that 100% like so much uh because or this fifth person in a group of a whole yes. bunch of trans people oh okay, please you know I mean? like, it'll be fun come on just go exactly <laughs> like yeah just to know what it feels like to be to not be the majority to not have the comfort and the understanding and the power of the majority that shifts people's mentality, which is what it comes down to. And so for me, I've said this for many years and I'm glad it's starting to take more you know, of a, of a normalized like standard. But for the longest time, I would say love isn't the answer. For me, it's suffering because people can experience, people can go a whole lifetime without experiencing love. People can go a whole lifetime without experiencing healthy love or even understanding what healthy love looks like. But outside of medical anomalies, generally speaking, people know what pain feels like, whether it's physical, whether it's emotional, they know what it feels like when something hurts. And to me, that is more of a connector than this idealized or theorized, you know, idea of what love is is like no I want I need something more concrete like you know what I mean like that feeling that you had when your 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 pet died you know that grief or like a friend of mine recently he was he just told me that you know he had never experienced depression and someone basically explained it to him he was as you know he had experienced his dad's passing and he was like imagine having that grief of your father passing every day like all day every day and it never goes away 
And he was like, in that moment, that's the first time he really understood what it would feel like to be depressed, even though he had never experienced it. And those are the moments that I like to tell people. That's why when I say like, even with the cognitive dissonance, connect to someone's pain. Know that accountability equates to someone's pain. You are hurting somebody and you have to step outside of yourself and your ego to understand and to, to take accountability for it. Wow, I just made someone feel pain. Focus on that. And, mm -hmm. you know, focus on wanting to make amends and make that not the case. I think that's because so brilliant. <laughs> this pain, pain is a unifier. Pain well, is, to me is more of a unifier than anything within the context of how society is. Now, will it always be the case? I hope not. And I hope love can be, you know, the answer many years down the line. But as of now, within this dystopia, <laughs> like, pain is what's uniting us whether you're poor whether you're cis whether you're trans whether you're black indigenous you know asian we're all experiencing pain and that's what the major unifier is right now is we're all suffering for various reasons but it still fucking hurts <laughs> mm -hmm. so how about we come together recognize that and try to figure out ways to help alleviate each other's suffering by being the support and being the the community that we're, that is needed. And that to me is what we're slowly starting to do and starting to see very, very slowly, slow, yes. slowly, so very slowly, but we're getting there as long as yes. it's happening. Yes. It's just, I, humans are slow and move. Yeah. And yes. It. But, you know, I, I don't talk religion often, but I'm, I'm a Buddhist. So, you know, speaking to pain and suffering, Buddhism is it's all about pain and suffering. Yeah, I'm like, exactly. oh, okay. I understand why we we're on the same page so much now. Because it's like, yes, <laughs> pain and suffering is like the only thing in life that's inevitable. And everyone's just like, ew, no, what's wrong with you? Don't talk like that. Yeah. <laughs> they're like, how you get it? They're just like, oh, love. It's all about love and togetherness and harmony. No, that's not what you, we need right now. You can't what we love need somebody is, if you is, don't understand their pain. Exactly. You know, you yeah. can't love somebody if you don't understand their pain. You have exactly. to understand their pain exactly i completely agree and that's funny because i'm anti-theist but buddhism i was considering being buddhist for a very long time and i would say that that's one of the things that i love about buddhism is life is suffering well it is an anti-theistic religion there is no deity really the buddha was a, a human figure who you know like you know so he's he's not really even a god yeah. <laughs> so i am still I mean, non-theistic even though i'm buddhist you know but yeah. i was like but uh yeah, I, but I love uh, that. I love that when I heard the like that quote, life is suffering. And I was like, that has been my entire life. Like I, when I tell people like I've suffered suicidal ideation in kindergarten, like I remember it vividly and people were just like, well, how do you, you know, know or whatever. And I was like, because I, at the time, you know, I believed in God and I prayed and I would pray not to wake up or I would pray, you know, try to suffocate myself with a pillow or in the bathtub, you know, try to hold my breath longer, you know what I'm saying, and basically drown in the bathtub. And I was like, because now I know why a lot of it was because of my autism and being introduced into a school environment and not having any supports and understanding. Mm -hmm. And also being one of the few black kids in a predominantly white Jewish area. So it was just like culture shock, culture shock. My parents, you know, got divorced. My mom got remarried. It was just, we moved. Like it was just so much going on at once. And just, I knew that I was different and then I didn't, I couldn't connect. And, and yeah. I internalized that, you know, as a kid and as a kindergartner, that's all you want at that point. It's just outside validation and just confirmation that like, you know what I mean? Like you can connect with, with your peers, you can connect with the teacher. And I just, the teacher loved me, but I couldn't connect with the kids. And it was just so painful. And I didn't, I didn't feel like I connected with my family. Like, I just felt like I was just an alien, which is classic autistic and nobody understood me which they didn't until I found my people <laughs> and mm -hmm. then I was like oh and I just can't imagine what it would have been like you know if I had found my people you know earlier would it, and I don't know if it would necessarily have helped or even if I would have been able to find my people because we didn't have the internet you know what I mean we didn't have <laughs> all these things that we have now and so yeah but yeah, it was whole. I hated school from kindergarten all the way through graduating from college. Dang. I hated fucking school. I yeah. hated it. <laughs> like, 
you could not pay me. And you know, all those like things where people were just like, oh, well, you know, if you had like a million, will someone pay you a million dollars if you go back, you know, through childhood or like, you know, puberty or whatever. Like, you got to fucking be kidding me. There's not enough money in mm-hmm. this world that no. will make me go backwards. Are you fucking kidding me? I got to go forward. I was like, I'm trying to see yeah. myself at 50. <laughs> like, that's what I'm looking forward to. I'm not trying to go backwards. Fuck that shit. Nope. I'm good. Yeah. Yeah, no, I, school was the worst time of my life. And like, I really like, yeah, I, the teachers didn't even like me. Yeah, you know, the kids didn't like me. The teachers didn't like me. It was, it was, it was a shit show. And I, I wouldn't go back. I left, I left school thinking I was completely incapable of learning. I didn't realize, oh, if I actually study things I like on my own, I can teach myself almost anything. But I thought I was completely incapable of everything uh, I, I I hated myself by the time I left school and it, it and they continued to hate myself more and more until I got to that point at that corporate office job where I was, you know, pondering driving off a bridge every day on the way home from work, you know, before I was finally diagnosed autistic because yep. it was like I hated myself so much because there were all of these expectations. The, the, the other thing it's like salt in the wound is when they tell you you're exceptional your whole life and for all yeah. of these things like I was a hyperlexic kid I was reading college level in elementary school you know I was in special ed I was in gifted and talented I was in mainstream I was in all of the different edu- like you know no one knew what to do with me but it was expected that I would be some amazing child because I started reading at one and a half but it was like I was hyperlexic and I was over, like the little kid that spoke like a professor with this big vocabulary, but I didn't understand mm-hmm. even a lot of things I was parroting. Me too. Uh, and I appeared wise by my years, but I was very, very immature in so many ways. So, and, and then it's like your whole life, they're like, pressure to be great, pressure to be great. I'm also the first grandchild. You know, so it's like all this pressure to be great. And, and like, I, I became this horrible perfectionist and like, just, just like so hard on myself because I couldn't attain and I was supposed to be able to attain, I thought, you know, and it was like, yeah. I can why can't I, do, you know, and I couldn't, I felt like I couldn't do the simple things, the simple things where it was hard and I couldn't understand it. Yep. And I, I was too focused before I knew I was autistic on all of my shortcomings to be, to have space to appreciate yeah. my skills. Me too. I relate to all of that with the exception of I'm the baby grandchild. Okay. So it was it was definitely the pressure of that. But also instead of being hyper, well, I don't know. I wrote really well, but I didn't necessarily read beyond my, but I wrote way beyond. If, I don't know if that would necessarily be considered the same. It tends, but, to, it tends to be kind of like an obsession with re- wording and read, reading and vocabulary and text. And see, I love tend to have a higher reading I'm, comprehension than spoken. See, I had you, shitty reading comprehension, but I think that was just because of my learning disabilities. But yeah. as far as being able to write and express myself, I was always ahead, like way ahead. I remember in sixth grade, like one of my teachers said, I, I wrote an essay that was basically on the level of like a ninth grader. And oh, I was wow, yeah. Grade. Yeah. And I was just like, I loved to write. And as long as I was writing again on something that I was interested in and that made sense to me and that I could actually articulate, um, I did well. But the second that it was something that I like didn't care about or didn't oh, keep my interest, yeah. that was it. But I didn't really like reading, I think, because it was more so my attention and I just couldn't focus and I would get so frustrated because I was like I was that kid that would read like for an hour and not be able to tell you what the fuck I read <laughs> like mm-hmm, I would just mm-hmm. like and, yeah. or read the same paragraph over and over and over again and it just not connect and it just not make sense especially if it was something I wasn't interested in it was just it was a waste of fucking time like yeah. literally a waste of time plus I have just so that was oh a whole yeah so yeah and and the same thing like they saw me write and they saw how I articulated myself and how it was so, you know, much older and beyond my years. And then they couldn't understand why I struggled with like basic concepts of math, like change and like, you know, reading a clock, like it took yeah. forever for me to understand. I'm like, how am I supposed to look at numbers? And it's not the value of the number. It's another number. <laughs> I don't read analog clocks. No sense. I'm just like, no, hard pass. I I (laughs) don't. I'm just like, you're telling me numbers. You taught me numbers. You taught me they have certain value. But now you're telling me those same numbers with those same values 
mean different things because they're placed in a circle on a fucking clock. How? <laughs> like what? And then it it's you they're counted by fives? Like what? <laughs> and then there's 60 minutes in a in I mean 60 like minutes in the hour and then there are multiple hours and like what? It just was mind blowing. I was just like, this makes absolutely no fucking sense to me. Like, I don't get no. it. And then all that time with all the all the teachers are just like, oh, well, you have to learn this because you're not going to always have access to a calculator. <laughs> or, oh, you have to learn this because, you know, you just like uh-huh. skills or whatever. And meanwhile, fast forward, we have a fucking calculator in our pockets, teachers. <laughs> like, and a whole set of encyclopedias and a dictionary. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly. Like, ah. I was just like, you made me go through all that for nothing, for absolutely nothing. But it is what it is. The viewers agree that analog clocks are evil. (laughs) They are. They're totally evil. Like, it makes no sense. Like, I I just think it's ridiculous. And so they're talking about, yeah. And so this is what I was thinking, too, with the hyperlexia. It tends to be about the reading specifically. Uh, And someone who has dyslexia says that they can write fine even though they have dyslexia and they can write really well uh so someone suggested maybe hypergraphia but we don't know if that's a thing or not so that'd be interesting to google and see if that's a thing yet but i think the thing to think about is that with us neurodivergent brains like with autistic people especially we are almost never just autistic like we're all i i don't know if i've met an autistic person that's not autistic plus in some regard like i'm autistic plus adhd hyperlexic i've got an anxiety disorder diagnosed as well you know like all these things i've got seizures you know it's like i've got ADHD, like plus hyper i've got a hypermobility disorder yeah. you know yeah. it's like there there are all of these yep. buckets that come like ibs ugh, like yep. god why i can't even yeah i think you're right so i'm trying to think of if i know anybody that's just autistic and i'm just like i don't i can't think of anybody off the top of my head like yeah no yeah and, and so just like a traumatized issue. autistic is like you know does that even exist considering the fact that this world is so anti-autistic so with that trauma of course then comes you know, anxiety, depression, you know, and, and possibly other triggers to other things. So yeah, we, we could do a whole like hour talking about like the systematic imp- or, you know, impacts on mental health of living in a system that is not des- like, I was like, oh, we could so do a whole hour and like geek out on that. I'm like, why like living in an environment that doesn't design with your needs into account, like just crushes your soul and destroys your mental you. health. <laughs> Let, oh, let's let's that. talk about doing another like we have to do another hour because we, we've done a little <laughs> over an hour like we have to do this again soon this was awesome. I like to. I had these I questions we didn't to. even need them we can come <laughs> you can bring things to rant we'll do this again because this was Yay. great um yeah and some people sent stars which I didn't even know was going to be turned on so I'm gonna, I'm gonna figure out how to send you some stars if anyone's sending me stars I'm gonna send them over uh <laughs> and it, and it, y'all see you know if you send those it is like pennies on the dollar Facebook does take most of it so I don't you know just so y'all know it's I, I yeah yeah not 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 the best way to support a content creator but it is enabled by default um but I'm gonna figure out what that ends up being I'll give it a few days because people might do more and I want to send those to you oh, for thanks. coming and sharing your time with me um, I'm so grateful for your time and I, I I think unfortunately we don't do a very good job always in this community of understanding the value of people's mental energy in their time and so yeah. I want to set a good example and since the viewers are sending stars I want to pass those along so just so everyone knows if anyone else sends them I'm going to pass those over <laughs> <laughs> thank you yeah yeah um i'm gonna end the live and then you and i can chat offline figure out when we can do it again and what we want to talk about uh and cool. when we can do this again because i think everyone really enjoyed it and hopefully one on facebook if, just so everyone's watching i will leave the live up it should automatically post i'm gonna go check and make sure the closed captioning works i should have a transcript from this and if i don't i'm gonna manually fix a transcript because I have a software, but that might take me some time. So if technology works, I'll get that sorted out really quickly for everyone. Uh, but I'm going to ask a little bit of patience just in case, because I haven't done one of these in a while. I've been in hiding um, and I'm kind of on partial hiatus for the rest of the year as I'm writing and writing and hiding. So uh, I'll be hiding, um, but it, keep you know dropping questions uh, and feedback for us. I think we both are people who can accept and appreciate 
useful and helpful mindful feedback uh, and things like that so if there's anything you were watching or dying to know or share i think i'll be checking the comments and uh you know for the next couple of days uh, to see what's coming through um is there anything you wanted to just say to close the floor out before i end the live just thank you for having me and this was amazing and i had so much fun and um if anybody wants to reach out to me i'm at asiatsu.coach on ig i'm more active on ig and if you mm -hmm. want to just directly um support me my venmo and cash app is asiatsu coach if y'all are, are y'all are doing the, the coins on facebook that is a better way because that way all of the money goes <laughs> that way instead of facebook stealing a touch uh so hey uh, feel free to drop i want you to drop your links in the chat comments after okay. we get off the live so that people can find your instagram and your payment links i want people to be able to find that too so they can okay. we'll uh, do. do that for you all right humans thank you all for hanging out with us this week we're gonna do this again because this yeah. was just fab <laughs> it was fab. same same all right everyone talk to you later <laughs>